Coming up on DTNS, PayPal starts taking Bitcoin, Amazon's Luna game streaming service launches, and is this the end for Quibi? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 21st, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In the Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Shane. Uh, we were just talking about Quibi uh, and uh, and some of our thoughts uh, extended on that, as uh, well as what comes after Gen Z. That's all on Good Day Internet. Get that wider conversation at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Dropbox Family Plan is now available worldwide. The new plan gives up to six users access to one interface, a shared space called Family Room, two terabytes of shared storage, and all the features of a Plus account for $20 a month. Subscribers who pay for a full year up front only pay $203.88, uh, which averages out to be about $17 a month. As Netflix predicted, its subscriber growth slowed in quarter three to a rise of 2.2 million subscribers, mixing its own forecast of two, or excuse me, missing its own forecast of 2.5 million. Revenue exceeded expectations, but earnings were off as well. Netflix also announced it will test a 48-hour free streaming event called StreamFest. This only happened in India, though, on December 4th. Acer announced several products, including a $109 smart speaker called Halo with Google Assistant and lots of LEDs uh, coming in Q1 2021. A 14-inch Acer Swift 3X laptop with Intel's Iris Z Max discrete graphics card starting at $900 in December. The Chromebook Spin 513, the first Chromebook to run on Qualcomm's Snapdragon 7C processor, coming to North America in February, starting at $400. New game monitors in its Predator and Nitro lineups. Most of them are IPS panels compatible with NVIDIA's G-Sync. And the Porsche Design Acer Book RS, designed in partnership with, as you guessed, Porsche. With the 11th gen Intel processors and Iris Z graphics, that one starts at $1,399. Which isn't all that bad. Uh, Ubisoft is merging Uplay and Ubisoft Club into a single hub for, quote, in game services called Ubisoft Connect. This starts October 29th with the launch of Watch Dogs Legion. It's a big game release coming up for them. Ubisoft wants to make cross platform progression and cross play available on most of its games. Ubisoft Connect will connect, or rather launch on PC, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and Nintendo Switch, and come to Xbox Series X and S and PlayStation 5 later. So you'll have to watch for that. It will come to Stadia, and uh, NVIDIA's GeForce Now, and Amazon Luna later this year. Facebook is testing a service in that place that always gets the coolest stuff first, Calgary, Alberta. It's a service called Neighborhoods that lets people connect to folks who live close to them. Kind of the next door clone. To join a neighborhood, you have to confirm your location and agree to let others in the group see your posts there. Uh, but it does not automatically grant other neighborhood users the right to see your profile info. All right. Let's talk Bitcoin because Scott's here. Uh, PayPal <laughs> will let U.S. customers buy, sell, and hold not just Bitcoin, but also Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash, which is a different cryptocurrency that's split off of Bitcoin, and another cryptocurrency called Litecoin. Those four to start with. Uh, they're partnering with a company called Paxos to do the wallet management uh, for all of these features. Buying and selling will roll out in the U.S. this month with the ability to fund your purchases coming in early 2021. So right now, if, once it shows up in your PayPal account, you'll be able to buy Bitcoin. You'll be able to, I guess, send Bitcoin to your friends. But in early 2021, you'll be able to actually use them to check out at PayPal, which includes 26 million PayPal merchants. Now, you would use your Bitcoin for the purchase, but it would be converted into dollars or euros or whatever local currency to give to the merchant. So the merchant would never see the Bitcoin. They would just get the money in the local fiat currency, as it's called. That'll eventually cost you a conversion fee as you convert your Bitcoin into the local currency. Uh, those fees are laid out. They're around a few percent, depending on how much the amount is. And PayPal will expand the features to Venmo and other countries in the first half of 2021. However, if you're converting Bitcoin into cash right now, which you can't do with merchants, but you could just do in your own account, uh, they're going to waive those fees through early 2021. Oh, so, and by the way, uh, Bitcoin's price jumped 8% to almost break $13,000, its highest point since July of last year. I was going to say that's a lot. So 
really what you what you've described and we've gotten a little more sense of it since we talked about it on our morning show this morning it's like any other currency transfer right now if i want to send money to a canadian uh, or pay for a canadian product or european or whatever i do that with paypal as far as it's concerned on my end those are dollars going out and they're getting euros or pounds or canadian dollars wherever it happens to be this is that just bitcoin is the money you have in your account and you're paying for items and they still get those currencies those denominations yeah that's the way it will work next year once right. once this is all up and running you can have you know two bitcoin in your account which right now would be twenty six thousand dollars that'd be quite a lot of money uh and then if you're paying for something that's a thousand dollars uh, they'll take the equivalent slice of Bitcoin out of your account, convert it to $1,000, give it to the merchant, uh, and deduct the Bitcoin from your account. But it's a way for you to use your Bitcoin to buy stuff without a merchant having to take Bitcoin. Uh, PayPal's acting as the intermediary. Paxos, if you're familiar with Coinbase or anything like that, Paxos is acting like that. They're the wallet where you can buy and sell your Bitcoin, and PayPal is doing the interfacing with the merchants and everything. So Paxos is essentially adding, providing the back end, which is the function you'll get now. What you'll get now is the ability to buy and sell the Bitcoin. Uh, in the future, you'll be able to convert it uh, at checkout. I think that's the big innovation here mm. is, man, PayPal. You can actually buy things with Coinbase accounts, but you have to have a participating merchant. PayPal is making that super easy. This is going to skyrocket uh, Bitcoin usage uh, quite a bit because instead of having to look for the places that take it, suddenly everywhere you see that has a PayPal checkout, you'll be able to use your Bitcoin holdings to pay. So do you think there's ever a day where um, you say, hey, Scott, um, I really, I'm going to buy that couch you're, you have for sale and um, I'm going to give you 10 Bitcoin for it and I'll be able to accept it as Bitcoin. And it went from your Bitcoin PayPal to my Bitcoin, Bitcoin, PayPal, and there was never any other dollars involved or anything? Do you think that's... I don't know. I wouldn't mm -hmm. say that'll never happen, but I think that's a, an end consequence of a lot of other factors. I think for, the, for a long period of time, it's just going to be, oh, I was able to get some Bitcoin. Oh, I want to buy a couch from Scott. Here, let me convert it into $300 or whatever he's charging for it. Sure. Well, it's a nice couch. Uh, moving yeah. on. So Bitcoin ain't going to save these guys. Ah, <laughs> uh, too bad. Qu Quibi just launched apps for Apple TV, Android TV, and Fire TV, but maybe hold out on downloading them unless you're really curious and just got to try a trial or whatever. The information sources say NBC Universal and Facebook declined to buy Quibi's catalog of video and Quibi chairman Jeffrey Katzenberg. Uh, and according to the Wall Street Journal, during a call with Quibi's investors Wednesday, Katzenberg announced the company would indeed shut down. Cue the funeral music. As Norman Chan on uh, Twitter said, Ninja lasted longer on Mixer. Ooh, uh, Norman <laughs> Chan and yeah. Chan getting in the burn. Yeah. Well, it's it is a fact. <laughs> Actually, we don't we we don't know the end date for Quibi, but probably yeah. I feel uh, a little uh, bad that I never tried Quibi because it it's comes not up too a late. lot on this. You got to hurry. <laughs> I, that's true. I can still hop in there and check it out. But somewhere, someplace thought that was a really cool future for content and figured that all the kids with their phones are going to want this and i don't know it feels pretty misguided so are you i guess you're probably not surprised that we're here we knew this was all coming I'll, I'll tell you what i am surprised about i am surprised that they are ending it now i thought that they would burn out the cash they've got according to the wall street journal something like seven or eight hundred million dollars still left to burn mm. uh and i would have expected katzenberg to you know go down swinging and just just use all the money until there was no more money and say, hey, sorry, investors. Um, I don't know if he's under pressure from the investors not to do that. I don't know if the continuing pandemic uh, made him realize that he can spend all the money he wants. It's not going to change the conditions soon enough. Uh, he needs people to be back out in the world to, to be able to fit his original business model, which is I'm waiting in line for a thing and a crowd of people, and I just want to watch something really fast. Whether that would have ever worked either, I, I'm skeptical of, but it's certainly not going to happen now. Yeah. Uh, and and they're slow to get these Apple TV, Android TV, and Fire TV apps up. Even the ones that they, they have done with Chromecast and such probably aren't delivering a whole lot of, of numbers. So uh, it sounds like maybe he just 
whether it was him, his own decision, a, a combination, or just the investors decided, you know what, I'm just going to give you what money we have left back, and you can cut your losses. All the TV apps feel like a weird last ditch kind of last breath effort because the whole point of the service was everyone's holding their phone and they're holding it this way and we're going to give content that will feed into that it'll be shorter but it'll be triple a names and people you know and stories and directors and stuff that's you know cream of the crop but not your tv and not in movie theaters where you don't have that phone in fact you're encouraged to put it away during those experiences so the last ditch effort toward the end say and we're putting apps out on all these you know, TV boxes just seems weird to me. Uh, from what I what I was reading, uh, one of the reasons that NBC and Facebook didn't want to buy the the video was uh, Quibi doesn't own most of it. So most of this video that was produced will just go back to the production companies that were contracted, uh, and they'll do whatever they want with it. I'm curious if they're able to sell the turnstile technology to somebody. Right. I'll keep an eye out for that. Following up on the antitrust lawsuit uh, that the U.S. Department of Justice filed against Google yesterday, we have some more reactions and clarifications that I think shed some good light on the situation. We talked about the basics yesterday, but now that people have really had a chance to process it, Protocol's Emily Birnbaum notes that the suit is quite narrow. The lawsuit itself focuses just on Google text search. It doesn't focus on video. It doesn't focus on image. It doesn't focus on shopping, which has been a subject of antitrust in other places. It focuses on contracts Google has with other companies to make Google a default text search engine. The suit does not bring up Google preferring its own products in that search, which would impact cases against Amazon and Apple. So it's not going to set a precedent there. It doesn't bring up Google acquiring companies to put them out of business as competitors, that's something that would impact Facebook. That's not going to set a precedent there. That means the facts of this case are fairly unique to Google and less likely to impact possible suits against other companies. That's one thing that's important to note. The New York Times' Steve Lohr also notes the focus on restrictive contracts and how that's been a successful basis for showing antitrust as far back as the beginning of the Sherman Act back in 1890. In fact, restrictive contracts against distributing Netscape was part of the winning case against Microsoft in 1998. One of the holders of a Google text search contract, Mozilla, however, says, be careful what you do. It could end up hurting us and not Google. Mozilla's Amy Keating wrote in a blog post, the ultimate outcomes of an antitrust lawsuit should not cause collateral damage to the very organizations like Mozilla best positioned to drive competition and protect the interest of consumers on the web. So they're like, don't just say they can't do contracts or pay for stuff anymore, or we run out of money. Back to Protocol's Birnbaum, she also notes that the suit calls out Google's use of personal information in exchange for free services. This is important because it can be used to show consumer harm. Google's defense is, hey, man, everybody gets our products for free. It's not harming consumers. So you might see the Department of Justice saying, well, they're not really getting it for free. They're giving up personal information that you then monetize. They're paying for it with their information. Mm -hmm. And the New York Times lore notes that Internet Explorer was also free, and the U.S. won its case against Microsoft because its practice of unbundling a free browser reduced innovation and consumer choice. So that's another argument the Department of Justice can make against Google. Uh, finally, I want to note Ben Thompson over at Stratechery uh, has an excellent, as he always does, a write-up of this uh, and notes the narrow focus on contracts, writing, quote, instead of trying to argue that Google should not make search results better, the Justice Department is arguing that Google, given its inherent advantages as a monopoly, should have to win on the merits of its product not the inevitably larger size of its revenue share agreements. So if you've been out there saying like, yeah, but isn't Google just making a better product? That's why they're so popular. The Department of Justice in the suit, according to Ben Thompson's interpretation, is saying, sure, they make a better product, but now they're staying in their position of market share, not because they continue to make a better product, but because they've locked everyone else out of the market. And they should have to continue to compete on being a better product. And then if they keep their percentage, that's great. Uh, but if they're not competing on being a better product, even if they maintain quality, it's not fair. It's not allowing anyone to compete with them. Uh, while Thompson does expect that Google probably will win this case, he points out that the issues that come up in the case, how they are explored, how they are judged, will provide a template for new legislation as to like, ah, the courts found this to be legal, we think it should be illegal and we'll make legislation uh, to change that. 
Well, one thing you said during all this really kicked something off of my head that didn't come up in my head earlier when we were prepping today's show, and that is the idea or the concept of quantifiable personal information dis, uh, designated as currency. In other words, could any of these rulings or could any of this future be, hey, turns out the personal information we give Google is worth something. It isn't yeah. just, hey, free product. We actually are paying with the thing we previously have not quantified. But maybe we should start quantifying what that is. Name and address. Okay, how about all this other info? What if it's also this info? What if it's all my login or my my web traffic info or whatever it is we end up giving Google in the end? Maybe that's worth something, and that's interesting. Like, it has yeah. a lot of ramifications, but that is a, a part of this I hadn't really considered before. Yeah, depending on how this plays out, that could be very precedent-setting in other ways as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, folks, if you want to talk about this... Uh, or lots of other things, uh, like how much Bitcoin you need to buy a GPU. That's one conversation that's happening right now in our Discord. Join on in. Uh, link it to a Patreon account by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Amazon's Luna game streaming service opened up to users by invite only. It costs you $5.99 a month, even if you get invited, uh, for access to around 50 games in the default Luna Plus channel. Now, channels from other game publishers like Ubisoft will eventually be available for purchase as add-ons. Uh, they're not now. Ubisoft is the only one we know is coming. It's not there yet. But if you want to get Luna Plus for $6 a month and you can wrangle an invite, uh, you'll be able to play it on Windows, Mac, desktop browsers, Fire TV, iPhone, and iPad. Not yet on Android. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> uh, Luna streams at 1080p. Uh, it doesn't support ray tracing, it seems like, yet. Although they say they support ray tracing, the ray tracing wasn't able to be turned on in a lot of the games that reviewers were try trying. So uh, the reviews are like, this is a pretty good service. They're not raving about it, but they're not trashing it either. Yeah, it seems all right. I mean, they have one, one up on Stadia, which is, you know, we're not charging for you for the games. You're paying for this service, and then the service has games. And then, of course, there's this whole, you know, add-on thing uh, that they'll be working with people like Ubisoft so that you can do it like you would with movies and and say, well, yeah, I really like Prime, but I'd sure like to add Showtime into my list, and that's yeah. a little bit like that. So those are interesting options and an interesting model to follow. Um, the thing about ray tracing is a little confusing to me because that shouldn't be an act of the service itself or the conveyance of the game to the people. That's all the streaming tech. Where that should be happening is in a rack of servers that are equipped to handle ray tracing. Then the stream is just whatever the stream is. Well, so, I, I, Ars Technica has an explanation. Uh, this isn't from Amazon. This is from Ars Technica. But it says, uh, Amazon said its Luna server stack would include NVIDIA's ray tracing capable T4 GPUs, but those are from the Turing generation, whose ray tracing prowess isn't as robust as this year's Ampere line. Gotcha. So they just don't have the newer cards or the newer chips in them. And that that's, may be it. that's fine. That makes sense. Also, 1080p, there are a lot of people that are like, well, if this isn't 4K60, then I'm out. And... I'm not one of those people. Um, I think 1080p is perfectly suitable for a service like this. It's pretty suitable for almost any kind of games. And before you call me old man stuck in his old, old resolution, I'm just saying we're at the point of diminishing returns. Instead of worrying about 4K, HDR, everything else, give me a really reliable 1080p service that comes over fast and as latency-free as you can. Make that the basis for your growth. If you can do better than that down the road, great. But... All those promises are fine. I just think for now, just give that a really good shot, and you might actually have something here, uh, or at least at the very least a decent competitor to things like xCloud, Stadia, and uh, you know NVIDIA's uh, Now service. So we'll see how yeah. they do. It feels to me like this is good if you want a supplementary service to your normal way of playing games that allows you some more flexibility to play on a bunch of platforms you wouldn't otherwise play on. You probably don't care if it's 4K if you're playing on your iPhone, to be honest, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And you it's just, just want hilarious. the thing to work. Yeah. It's hilarious you'll be playing that on your iPhone and not your Android phone at first because usually this is flipped, right? You've yep. got the whole trying to get through Apple's mess and you could get conspiratorial saying, well, they've got some deal because of their streaming services or whatever. But we know how they're doing it. They're doing it through this uh, browser method. And why they're not doing that on Android yeah. yet, I don't know. You can do a progressive web app over at Android, but maybe yeah. that's just taking longer to get that done. I don't know. Yeah, don't know. Well, uh, let's play a little time for Did You Know? Oh, tell me. All what right, didn't here I go. know? App Annie released a report comparing Gen Z movie behavior. Tom, we're one of those, by the way, the Gen Zs. 
uh, movie behavior with everybody older than 25, which is will henceforth be referred to as the olds. So well, I, I think guess. we're the olds. Are we the, we're olds? the older than 25? All right. Yeah. Gen, Z, Gen spends, Z are the younger than 25. Oh, I keep I'm, thinking Gen X. I did that again. My son's Gen Z. But yeah. this is how you know a Gen Xer because he can't remember which letter he is. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Remember, there's only three generations. Boomers, <laughs> Millennials, and Gen Z. And then I guess there might be another one that everyone always forgets about. That's how I remember. <laughs> That's how I remember it as well. All right. Gen Z spends 4.1 hours more per month on non-game apps. That's 10% longer than the olds. Oh, I have a really good anecdotal thing to say at the end of this. However, the old spend 20% longer in their most used games and access them 10% more often. Hmm. So that's so interesting. the olds spend more time playing the games. That's what, are, right. what are they playing? We don't give up and move on. I don't know. Maybe World of Warcraft because we're old. Uh, the most popular game category amongst the olds are puzzle games. All right. Tops, <laughs> tops among uh, Gen Z action games. Both categories have simulation games as number two. Oh. Look, um, old people and young people agree. Simulation games are almost <laughs> our favorite. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are very action-oriented, though, so it leans Z. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, the top apps among Gen Z were Snap, TikTok, and Discord. Uh, that order, I assume that's order of most used. I don't actually know that, but that makes sense. Well, uh, it's actually a weirder thing. It's it's uh, the most over-indexed. Oh, uh, So there, there's, a, there's some math behind determining, like, you know, what's the index of usage and, and do they use these uh, higher than the normal index? And that's where you get uh, Snap and TikTok. Uh, and it goes by market. It's different in different markets. Well, so speaking it, of so that, it's, this, it's, yeah. it, it, Discord is definitely third. Snap and TikTok might be one or two, depending on which market you're talking sure. about. Sure. And, and speaking of that, this is interesting. Active Gen, C, Gen Z users are rather are rising faster than the old with Indonesia and Brazil seeing the most growth. So huh. a lot of interesting international points of data there. And finally, 98% of Gen Z owns a smartphone. That makes sense to me. I don't know why it'd be any different. They basically don't know life without them. Now, I have a son who is a Gen Z. He is 20 years old. He fits nicely into that little category. He's born in the year 2000. And I can tell you, Almost all of this rings a bell. Almost all of it seems right to me. Just from my own anecdotal experience with him, that he spends more time on non-game apps than than a lot of us do. He spends a lot of time watching stuff that was popular before I was even uh, old enough to think it was popular. Things like Taxi. Like, he watches Taxi over and over and over. He loves the show Taxi. Can't figure it out. But again, spending a lot of time watching things that don't have anything to do with games. And he watches them on a mobile device. He yeah, doesn't watch on them, mobile whereas devices. Old people watch things on television. Why well, am I going to watch this on my phone? Right. It's it a very big screen. My eyes are bad. At the most, it's like a TV, or you know, he's using a computer screen, or he's watching it while he's playing a game. Like right. this concept of sit down in front of a television for the event that is television watching, not in his vocabulary. It's just not a thing he does. Um, this other bit here about TikTok, Snap, and Discord, with the exception of TikTok, he totally loves that in that order. He loves Snap, and he loves Discord. He thinks it's cool to hate on TikTok, but that may just be a, I don't know what that is. That's how you he's, know it's popular. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the other bit that really stood out to me was them spending less time in the actual most used games and moving, maybe, you know, the theory is moving on to something else. He totally does that. He will sometimes rip through it, destroy whatever game he's playing, and then move on or get bored and move on. But either way, it's not like a long, I'm going to be in a community playing this one game for a really long time. It's new and shiny. Go get on that. Play it until you're sick of it. Go move on to something else. Definitely different behavior than I have. So yeah. anyway, we're, interesting We're still stuff. sitting there playing our puzzle game, trying to get it to, to solve. What's great about this, this little segment today was, did I know? I, I guess I did. I just didn't know I did. You didn't I didn't know, know all these did. things. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, let's finish up with a supercomputer. Europe awarded Hewlett Packard Enterprise, or HPE. That's the one that doesn't make printers. Remember when they split <laughs> HP up? Yep. Uh, HPE is getting $160 million to build a supercomputer called Lumi in Finland. Maybe Patrick Beja can go visit it. Uh, it is expected to have peak performance of more than 550 petaflops. I want to know what a petaflop is. There's an episode of Know a Little More at knowalittlemore.com. 550 petaflops would top the current number one supercomputer, the Fugaku Petascale computer in Kobe, Japan. That one reached 415.5 petaflops in June of this year. 
Lumi will be hosted at the Finnish IT Center for Science in Kajani, Finland. It will be made up of HPE Cray EX servers with AMD Epic processors and AMD Instinct high-performance graphics cards. It will also use HPE's Cray Cluster Store E1000 storage system and HPE Slingshot technology for networking. Power will be generated by a Swedish hydroelectric electric company called Waterfall and heat from Lumi will be used to heat homes in Finland. HPE is also making supercomputers for the Czech Republic and Western Australia. Nice. That's pretty cool. I yeah, guess. So soon, 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 we will have a new number one supercomputer in Finland. I'm ready. Uh, yeah. the, chess, the chess world is shaking in their boots. Let's see if what happens. Yeah, I was going to say, if you want to go uh, on, a, on a tour of supercomputers, you can, you can end up with number one right now in Kobe and get yourself some delicious beef. But in the future, you'll be able to go to Finland and get Finnish food. <laughs> so weird fish and like rotting tentacles from things. That's fine. Yeah, it's Pat delicious. Pat Patrick can correct all this on Tuesday. I'm not worried about what I say. It's fine. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Cesar answered our call for firsthand experience with selecting a search provider other than Google on phones in Europe. He writes, since you asked, I am a European citizen, Romanian to be precise, and I have noticed the pop-up select my search provider when setting up my phone. Thank you. We finally got one. I own a Galaxy S10e and did not have this as part of the initial setup when I bought my phone, but rather when I at one point reset my phone. Probably from recent updates, my phone did give me the option to choose my preferred search provider as promised by Google. My guess is that most users won't see this because of one or all of the following. One, old phones with old software. Two, even if the phone has received updates and now has the browser ballot, people tend to not reset their phones. As such, they won't be seeing the setup screen more than once or twice in the device's lifetime. Or three, people just click next, next, next in a hurry and get to the shiny new toy, don't even realize they did it. There you go. You now have a larger sample size. Thank you, Cesar. <laughs> uh, he says, P.S. I stayed with Google, but use multiple browsers and search engines on my own, depending on the use case. Interesting. I do that too. That sounds yeah. a lot. I, I bet there's more and more people that are doing that. I use DuckDuckGo in some cases. I use different browsers. I have DuckDuckGo DuckDuck as my default mobile search engine. Same, same. Yeah. I like their image search a lot better too when I'm trying to find references for art and stuff. It's so much better than Google's now, and I don't know why that is. Probably because Google has to be so much more careful about copyright, given their spotlight. But it, yeah. I did want to say one quick thing about um, about this, and that is that uh, I noticed Windows getting a little pesky the other day. It's been a long time since we've talked about Windows being a problem with favoring Explorer, now Edge, and that sort of thing. But I went and changed my default from Edge to Firefox, and... It kept bugging me and saying, are you sure? Let me tell you why Edge is so great. Like a little That's because they box. just bundled in Edge with the new October update. Yeah, go. which I don't know. That just feels like old, old stuff and made me nervous. Uh, there's one more email here that we got from David who says, no one is really from here, Charlotte, North Carolina. That's where he's from. He chimed in about photos not being real life. He emailed this, listening to your discussion on Tuesday in regards to photos being touched up. This made me think of an old picture that was in my house when I was growing up of my great, great grandparents. The photo always looked odd to me. And I found out that this was because the photo was taken when they were out working in the field. When the traveler photographer came through uh, after the, after the picture developed, he would watch, sorry, he would draw nice clothes onto them and bring the nice photo back later after putting the clothes on them. This just goes to show that nothing is really new, just done differently. Love the yeah. show. Thanks for all you do. Yeah, that's that reminded me of this picture of my great grandfather John. I never wonder. I never once wondered if those are really his clothes. Yeah, maybe or were they not. drawn on later? I have no maybe, idea. Maybe they're not. They you never know. Be. Yeah. <laughs> That's anyway, cool, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Justin Zellers, Miss Music Teacher, and Mike McLaughlin. Scott Johnson. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is the part where Sarah usually thanks you. <laughs> so uh, sorry for almost forgetting it. Uh, what do you got going on these days? Oh, tons of stuff. But I will mention the thing that you and I are uh, dusting off, our first season of Current Geek Chronicles, uh, sort of an evolution of Current Geek. If you haven't heard it yet, well, uh, great news. We have a little ninth episode that just went out that is like an appendix of sorts to the other episodes. So go check it out. That's at currentgeek.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, patrons, did you know your ad-free RSS feed can have just DTNS or just GDI or both? Check your tier on Patreon to see if it says DTNS, GDI, 
or all. And if you want to change it, you just change your tiers at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 20.30 UTC, at least until Daylight Savings comes. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow without me, but with Rich Straffolino, who's here along with Justin Robert Young. They will talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>